27 hours is how much time we had to review AMD's RX Vega 56, their direct competition to the GTX 1070 by NVIDIA. The 56 is a $400 card. We're looking at it from a lot of angles today, including undervolting, overclocking, BIOS modding, uh, HBM versus core overclocking, and we'll try to get into thermals, power consumption, and gaming performance, though some of that may have to be saved for a separate video because we're about nine hours away from Embargo Lift. Before getting to that, this video is brought to you by Synergy, the software that lets you share a keyboard and mouse between multiple systems. If you have limited desk space and multiple computers to command, Synergy removes the need for separate peripherals or a KVM and works as an over-the-network software. Use our link below to get 50% off the basic or pro version. We won't be going over any of the very basics today. If you need pricing information, specs, things like that, check the article below or check other content creation outlets. We're focusing on data because that's what we have time to do. So first off, overclocking notes on it and issues we encountered. Vega 56 was very exciting to us when it was first announced, specifically because as a $400 card with the specifications it carried and with what we knew about FE, 56 looked like it could overclock to outperform a Vega 64 card or at least perform equally if you know what you're doing. Or even if you don't, you just kind of hack at it. But we were let down. Working with Buildzoid, we wanted to set forth to turn Vega 56 into effectively a Vega 64, because the CU difference really would become less significant as frequency increases. We quickly found that 56 is limited to 300 watts of power by BIOS. That is a hard limit, despite the fact that the VRM can easily handle more. It is, after all, the very same VRM as on VFE and Vega 64. The core and the VRM can handle the wattage, but we're not given the allowance stock. 300 amps really shouldn't be a problem. 360 watts shouldn't be a problem, but we're stuck at 300. So what's the solution? Well, you flash BIOS. That's normally the way it's done. Fortunately, these cards, the AMD reference ones, do have a dual BIOS switch, so there's really no risk in doing it as long as you don't flash both. In flashing BIOS, using the newest version of ATI Flash, which is Vega compatible, we found that there's a security block on the BIOS that prevents any kind of modifications to BIOS. And that includes changing things like the name of it. So what we ran into was a successful flash. It applied correctly. Rebooting, you get a black screen, no display initialization, and an error code on the motherboard that indicates as such. So to fix this, you boot back in, you flash back, and you're good to go. Unfortunately, this is because of AMD's security features that they've added with Vega and AMD tells us that they are to comply with the secure boot protocol set forth by Microsoft and other vendors. Unfortunately, that protocol does infringe on enthusiast demand to be able to play with a video card, but that's not, that seems to be taking the back seat here, as has been the case lately. So this was a big letdown to both Buildzoid and myself. We were really hoping for a lot more out of AMD, a company which traditionally has advocated openness and permitted, whether explicitly or not, some level of modding that their competitors don't necessarily permit, at least not at the same level. After rolling back, we next tried a registry hack. This registry hack works with Vega Frontier Edition to the point where you can push 400 watts through it if you want to. So it's known to work. It's just a, it's a power tables hack. You install it, you're good to go. With Vega 56, the power tables mod available for FE doesn't work at all. So either a new one needs to be written or it's just not going to work. We think that it might be possible at some point, but today is not that point. So the registry mod that works for this does not work for 56, and the BIOS flashing works, but you can't change it. So there's no getting around that 300 watt limit, which means that as you'll see later in the performance section, there's a whole lot of performance left on the table for Vega 56 because there's just no overclocking headroom, which is a power choke. Moving on here, we also probed HBM voltage. So HBM2 voltage, looking at it with a DMM, we found it to be 1.3 volts. It's a little bit lower than our VFE. This partly contributes to the lower achievable HBM2 clock on Vega 56, as it's not getting as much voltage. V-Core now maxes out at 1.2 volts as well, rather than 1.25 volts on VFE, furthering the overclocking limitations on Vega 56. Anyway, despite being disappointingly limited in overclocking, we can still use Vega 56 to prototype a few things. Undervolting is one of them, and then we can play around with the overclocking or HBM2 versus core clocking, which is what we're about to do in this content. A couple of notes here. Overclocking Vega, just like with FE, has a lot of bugs along with it. AMD acknowledges these, at least openly to the media. And if you want to overclock as well, 
you're going to have to keep an eye out for some of these, although in two weeks, once this thing comes out, hopefully they're resolved. But 64 buyers will need to keep an eye out for things like misreported frequency and misreported voltage, where occasionally the voltage readout in Wattman, and I'm not sure about other tools, but Wattman especially, will not match what you should see if you probe the back of the card. Uh, and also frequency will sometimes report things like 1250 megahertz while still performing at 1600 megahertz levels of performance, i.e. 1070 levels, despite reading about four, 300, 400 megahertz lower. Let's call it 300 to be uh, more accurate. So those are items of note for overclocking. A lot of the software is wrong. Don't trust it. Just do the overclock, run a quick fire strike test. If the score improves, great. If it doesn't, there's a problem. And that's the best way to validate this right now, not by looking at clocks as UOC. Let's start off with HBM2 versus core clock overclocking. The behavioral outcome of HBM2 versus core clock is going to change based on the application and the card, so these results will not apply evenly across all games and cards. Some are more memory intensive than others, but this is just kind of a quick look at things. Firestrike 1080p graphics scoring increments as we overclock the card. Stock, we're at 18816 points for an average FPS of 90 in GT1. Increasing power target by 50% boosts us to 21188. No other changes, so just power offset. And our power consumption goes from about 196 watts to about 300 watts at the PCIe rails. That's not the total system draw, that's PCIe cable output. We'll talk more about power in a moment though. Anyway, that's a gain of about 12.6% in this benchmark from the power target offset. It's not linear to all games, of course, but it is significant here. If we overclock HBM2 and offset the power target, we end up about 3.6% boosted at 950 megahertz HBM2 over just the power target offset. It's not a bad gain from HBM2 only. Overclocking to 980 megahertz HBM2 with a 10% offset on core because manual input didn't work. We had to use percentages for the most part. That boosts us to 6.4% over the power offset with no HBM2 overclock or nearly 19.6% over stock. The memory overclock and power offset alone get us 19.2% over stock, and the power offset gets us 12.6% over stock. The takeaway here is that, first of all, power target offset does a whole lot for you, and unfortunately it increases power, but we have a solution to that. It's undervolting. We'll get there. Aside from this, the next takeaway, HBM2 overclocking, in our quick testing, appears to be more relevant for performance than core overclocking. If you had to pick one, pick HBM2, push it as high as you can, and roll forth without noticing much of a loss. We were at a couple percentage points max from overclocking the core alongside HBM2. So that's the main takeaway. And a lot of this limitations, the reason we stop where we do is because we're starved for power. You can tell this by just looking at the current clamp while it's drawing, it never goes over 300 watts. So we're clearly starved and this is a BIOS limit. It's unfortunate that it's there, but hopefully AIB partners will have some flexibility to do custom BIOS or in the very least remove some of those security features, although that seems unlikely so that you can push it further if you wanted to, because the card is capable of more. It's got a great VRM in it. This is one of the best reference cards that we've ever seen, and yet we can't really tap into the full potential of the VRM, so that's unfortunate. Anyway, the overclocking was disappointing. Let's try the opposite. Let's undervolt it. Here's a chart showing Vega 56 power as measured at the PCIe cables with a current clamp running 12.3 volts, an absolute stock configuration, and during a half hour burn in with Firestrike, the V56 consumes on average about 180 watts at the PCIe cables, not accounting for the other 28 watts or so at the PCIe slot, which is responsible for fan power at 2.4 amps and 12 volts. Here's what the power draw looks like when we increase the offset by 50%. Remember, earlier we saw that increasing power target alone could stabilize clocks and improve performance upwards of 12% in Firestrike when comparing to the stock config. Of course, doing this also increases power and lands us at 270 watts sustained power consumption at the cables, rather than nearly 100, about 100 watts lower. Here's where it gets interesting. When undervolting, we managed to stabilize at 1025 millivolts with DPM states 6 and 7 set to 1652 megahertz. Big note here, this is the clock output as we see it in software. The real clock output is about 1524 megahertz, so you have to put in a higher number than you receive because AMD now has a dynamic clock. Anyway, we've dropped from 1200 millivolts to 1025. That's huge. The increase in power target of 50% along with this increases the speed overall in frequency and the result is clear. The first 300 seconds or so that you see it going crazy is when we were trying to work with AMD's software issues, at which point we gave up on Wattman and resorted to Watt Tool, which is a fantastic solution for getting this type of work done. Doing this made undervolting work 
And as we see when the line levels out around 210 watts, we overall reduce power from the 50% offset at a slight increase over the baseline. Note also that the line is nearly perfectly flat now, meaning that we've controlled for fluctuations in power delivery and clock frequency. The result is smoothed out performance on the whole while drawing 55 watts less power than the offset V56, but 30 watts more than the stock card. Ultimately, we get away with better performance. And let's look at a frequency chart next. Check this out. We're at higher clocks than just the 50% offset. 1524 MHz, steady as a sniper, versus 1475 MHz. The stock card reports 1300 MHz here, resulting in a 224 MHz boost for 30 watts more power. Not a bad trade at all. There's plenty of more room to play, too, if you were to get serious about it. We kind of cut it off here and called it a day for now. Big note, there's a bit of a reporting bug with Vega right now. Sometimes the frequencies look a bit funny. It's always the same level of funny, though. It seems to be an accurate misreporting in software. So when you're looking at frequencies, it's kind of like if you were to take K-type thermocouples, you have a known range of variance. Maybe it's 2.2 Celsius or something like that. But that thermocouple is always that same amount of measurement off. It's always one Celsius off, always in the same direction. Uh, so it's kind of like that here, where the frequency appears to be uh, oddly read out in the same fashion across all tests. So in the very least, it's accurate in that regard, although we don't know the true frequency because of AMD's new way they've set up Vega and the way they've set up the software. It's hard to know, but we did talk to them at length about this. Finally, here's a look at the temperatures. The fan was left alone for all these tests, so there's obviously maneuverability for users willing to speed up or slow down on the fan. With V56 at 50% offset, we were at 84 Celsius by the end of the test, quite warm. The stock card and undervolted card both fluctuated around the 74 to 75 C mark. Undervolting gave us more clock speed, a middle of the road power metric, and didn't impact thermals negatively. That's a big improvement, more or less across the board. Power is not so bad either. Just as a very quick aside, here's a PWM to noise response chart. We're at about the same noise level versus VFE with invariance anyway, as it's the same cooler. Nothing new to discuss here. Our auto speed on V56 tends to be 44% RPM, which outputs about 48.8 dBA, and that's when you're in heavier operation. The fan will sometimes sit closer to 40%, technically 39, for lighter workloads, which is about 45.8 dBA. Certainly neither quiet nor efficient, as it is a blower fan. The cooler is just not very good, but that's always been the case for these types of designs. We really have to look out for AIB partner cards later to look for something with improved cooling. That said, the VRM is good, so maybe a good H2O candidate if you want to dodge the bullet of AIB partner cards where you pay for something you're not going to use. Anyway, there was much talk of power consumption earlier. Here's a comparative chart showing idle power consumption at the wall. Again, at the wall, not at the rail. So we've switched how we're measuring from earlier. Wall draw, the total system operates at 76 watts with Vega 56, which places it near its RX 580 predecessor. The GTX 1070 FE operates at 67 watts idle or 12% lower. Ghost Recon Wildlands provides a gaming workload that places the Vega 56 at 332 watts power draw, adjacent to our 1080 Ti SE2 and just past the RX 580 Gaming X overclock systems. Again, systems here. The GTX 1070 system has about 27% lower power consumption than the RX Vega 56 system. The overclock 1070 consumes about 283 watts for the total system. For Honor shows power consumption at 313 watts for Vega 56 with the GTX 1070 FE stock at 232 or 26% lower power consumption. Finally, 3D Mark Firestrike puts us at 303 watts system draw with the GTX 1070 FE at 212 watts system draw. Again, that's a difference of about 30%. The RX 580 operates about the same here once we've overclocked it, and Vega FE system pulls 381 watts. Note that because of timing for filming this review and running tests, there may be some additional Vega numbers or other numbers on these charts that aren't verbally mentioned. They'll be there, but we're kind of running a lot of tests alongside filming the video. Next, some brief discussion on thermals. Starting off with a look back at Vega Frontier Edition, including our hybrid mods and 40 dBA noise normalized testing, the Vega 56 card runs a GPU core temperature of about 74 to 75 C under stock conditions. This requires a 38 to 44 percent fan speed, depending on how the application enumerates the clock and impacts the VRMs and things like that. GPU temperature is therefore lower than VFE's stock, but not all that much. It's about what you'd expect given that they're the same cooler in a different GPU, just slightly. Fan PWM to RPM response isn't too different here either. The MOSFETs also measure similarly for the right side hotspot where we observe a 63C measurement on the Vega 56 card. 
This is completely within reason for a video card and for a VRM and can even be run without a base plate or VRM fan at all. Probably not the best, but we've tested it and you can actually do it, at least on VFEs. So no trouble there. Measuring the backside hotspot on the PCB opposing the top inductors, the V56 card reports a 65 Celsius for the PCB rear temperature. We removed the backplate later and saw that it improved thermals in this department by about 3 to 5 Celsius as the backplate is acting like a heat trap and preventing heat from escaping adequately. AMD could probably ventilate this better in the future, but it's a reference card, so what are you going to do? For a comparison to the 1070 FE, here's a look at a 3D Mark burn-in for half an hour. The 1070 system draws about 250 watts at the wall during the burn, with the RX Vega system drawing about 300 watts at the wall, or about 20% more. Thermally, the 1070 prefers to run a higher core temperature of 78 to 79 Celsius in favor of a lower noise level, with its fan operating at 53% and 42 dBA output. The RX Vega 56 reference card prefers to stabilize at 74 to 75 C, with its fan operating louder, 44% and 48.8 dBA, a noticeable step up in noise, but slightly cooler. There's room here to decrease noise and increase temperature if you wanted to, but it really make more sense to go with a partner cooler instead at that point. Let's get to gaming. We're not going to have every single game tested with undervolting. We're not going to have overclocking results on here just yet. Before people start crying and saying, Steve, why don't you manipulate the space-time continuum and make it so that there's enough time to do everything in 27 hours that you've had the card, uh, we're working on it. This, this, this review has a lot of stuff in it already, especially given the circumstances. So work with me here. This is the initial data. We have 1070 and V56 performance stock. Uh, some overclock numbers in there, not too many. And we'll look into it more, but let's just kind of hold off on two firmly drawing conclusions just yet, especially with the uh, clock modifications and things like that that are forthcoming. But this will give you a, a first look in the very least. Oh, and as a note, we did work on undervolting things and testing them in games, but it's really buggy. It sometimes will go down only three amps instead of six amps, and sometimes it goes down the full six amps, and sometimes it doesn't go down at all in power consumption. So it's really hard to know when undervolting is actually working, and we haven't figured out what causes it to break yet. Anyway, starting with Ghost Recon at 4K, the RX Vega 56 performs at 32 FPS average, lows at 29 and 28. The GTX 1070 reference card and SC cards both sit at around 35 FPS average, setting Vega to a plus 50% power target gets it to 39, and overclocking the 1070 SC ties it with Vega at this point. These are within variance and are effectively equal. There's not a so-called victor in a 0.3 FPS difference, they're the same. At 1440p, the RX Vega 56 card operates at 57 FPS average, placing it behind the 1070 reference card by 7.6% or behind the SC by 8.8%. Overclocking the SC lands it at 68 FPS, with Vega 56 adjacent when set to plus 50% power target, or about 65 FPS average. Overclocking HBM2 and the core will help here further, in theory, though we'll test that more soon. In this configuration, we're measuring 25 amps or 300 watts at the PCIe cables on the V56. At 1080p, the V56 operates at 74 FPS average, or 84 FPS when set to the plus 50% power target. The GTX 1070 runs an 83 FPS average stock, 85 FPS for an AIB SC, and 90 FPS when overclocking the SC. Where Ghost Recon tends to show an NVIDIA advantage, Sniper tends to show an AMD advantage. So goes the world of games where everyone optimizes differently. At 4K, V56 operates an average FPS of 53, followed by the overclocked 1070 SC also at 53 FPS average, though with marginally less consistent frame times. The GTX 1070 SC at 49 FPS is 8% behind here, with the reference 1070 at under 50 FPS at this point. Note also that Vega Frontier Edition comes off looking pretty poor in this scenario, given its tied performance with V56. From what we've been told by Rob of Tech Gauge, check them out, friend of the site, the Vega 64 and 56 cards still possess decent professional performance, actually very good in the 64's instance in some cases, and sort of makes VFE look even odder, in our opinion, than it already did, but check their review out for more on workstation stuff. Ashes of the Singularity and DX12 runs V56 at 67 FPS average, with the GTX 1070 SC trailing 5% behind at 63 FPS. The reverence card operates a 61 FPS average. Overclocking levels things out, though we haven't fully overclocked V56 yet, so AMD still has some room there to boost beyond the 1070 SC. Check back, hopefully, this week for more of that. With For Honor at 4K, the V56 runs 38 FPS average against the 1070 reference card's 41 FPS average. Vega FE sits at 40 FPS average in this title, for reference. 
At 1440p, the V56 runs 7% behind the reference 1070, or 9% behind the SC. Frame rates here are in the 70s for Vega 56, with the GTX 1070s stretching to the low 80s. 1080p illustrates the gap the most with the GTX 1070 FE at 123fps average versus 111 of the V56. The SC operates at 127fps average, so these are 11 to 14% ahead in this title. But any strong gain there will be countered by Doom. Doom at 4K posts the V56 at 61fps average with the 1070 SC at 54. Like Sniper, AMD tends to receive favor in Doom from Vulcan, which is what we're seeing here. The lead over the 1070 SC is about 13% in this particular title, countering the last one for NVIDIA for one of the more remarkable boosts over the 1070 baseline. Finally, we just added Hellblade to our bench, so it presently only has the 1070 SC and V56 on the charts. 4K yields about 30 FPS for both sets of devices, so we'll skip that. At 1440p and very high, Hellblade positions the 1070 SC at 57 FPS average, and the Vega 56 is sort of nearby. And before anyone cries that the reference 1070 isn't on here yet, yes, we're aware. No, we can't manipulate time and space. There's more work to be done, we know. But the limited time AMD provided for this bench means that for now, this is where it stands. So that's it for now. This was a lot of work already. We had, like I said, something like 27 hours to do it all. And there's plenty more to be done. This is a, a fairly conclusive review in some aspects, thermals and power but there's a lot more to learn in gaming. Check out other sites as always to pick up multiple sources of information because everyone's gonna be looking at different stuff right now because we all had no time. Most people had one to three days and this was sandwiched between Threadripper components. So uh, it's an interesting choice by AMD to decide to launch Vega right after one of their biggest CPU launches of the year and of the decade and give everyone two to four days to work on Vega. Not sure why they did that, but uh, that's why you're gonna see a lot of reviews today that are probably going to be along the lines of, here's the data I've collected so far. We're gonna have to look more into it to really make conclusions, which is basically what I'm saying here. So we've got conclusions on some things. Power, clearly V56 draws more. It's anywhere from 20 to 30, sometimes a bit more, 20 to 30% more power in the same scenario as the GTX 1070. In games, it's kind of plus or minus 8%, depending on what game you tested. The Nvidia ga the games that tend to favor NVIDIA and the AMD games are the games that tend to favor AMD were showing basically opposite results. So you get one where it's plus 13% NVIDIA and one where it's plus 13% AMD. Just depends on what you're playing. You really need to look into the games that you play, figure out which ones fit those metrics, and that kind of dictates your card to some extent. And then the biggest thing here is mining. So this is the other reason why I hesitate to do any kind of really firm conclusion right now. We have no idea what these cards will be priced at hours after release. So we're told $400 is MSRP, just like we're told from Nvidia that their 1070 MSRP is what? 400 or 380 or something like that. Somewhere, somewhere around there. But it's clearly not available at that price. Most of the other cards on the market aren't available at MSRP. So we'll see how long it lasts, if at all, for V56. And then at that point, it's not a question of whose MSRP is lower. It's a question of whose available price is lower. So it's way too hard to tell definitively which card makes the most sense right now without seeing how the prices land. But you've got the numbers, so that gives you some preliminary information to think about. And then from there, hopefully stay on top of coverage and uh, maybe watch the prices, see where they fall. So that's all for this time. Check back for more, subscribe for additional coverage on this card. And I think it's 3 a.m. So I've got about uh, four hours of editing, writing and uploading to go. So hopefully this will make it online at embargo lift. Subscribe for more, patreon.com slash gamersx helps out directly. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time. go to sleep now.